measuring my stem wire earlier, and I discovered that I happen to have a 750 milliliter glass in my collection. As luck would have it, I also happen to have precisely that much Merlot. A coincidence such as this simply cannot be ignored. So let's see if we can get through this before I'm finished reading off my program notes for the episode. We're calling it an experiment. So here goes. The things I do for you guys. Okay, this week's challenge comes from WashingtonComposersForum.org. The posting on the website reads, Washington Composers Forum announces a call for scores for performance on such and such a date. Pieces should be under 10 minutes, scored for a saxophone quartet. The winning composer will receive a performance of the piece and a recording of the performance. The call is open to the general public. Composers may submit multiple scores for saxophone quartet. The performers will adjudicate the call and may choose not to perform any of the submissions. Submissions must be received by such and such a date, etc., etc. The call for submissions doesn't specify the particular instrumentation of the saxophone quartet in question. There is a low resolution picture on the quartet website from a bit of an awkward angle, and based on what's visible, mostly the playing position of their right hands, it looks like they're holding a soprano, alto, tenor, and very sax. It's hard to tell though, since their instruments are partly obscured by their music stands, but since it's a professional ensemble, I'd say it's a pretty safe bet that at least some of them will be willing to double on enough instruments to play whatever reasonable instrumentation the composer might throw their way. That seems likely, right? I considered an approach whereby I'd write out a conventional melody, then abstract it into oblivion, and finally arrange that for a quartet. But then I remembered a sketch that I had made for a project that I worked on earlier. I set it aside at the time because it didn't fit my goals for that project, but I think it works better in this context. Keeping a notebook of old ideas will be handy for things like that sometimes. Now, this motive becomes this. And I've got a head start on the work of abstracting the phrase. So that becomes this. Which I think succeeds in its own way in making a formal statement while avoiding any cliché that I can think of. Look at how the modally borrowed submedia helps support the tension through the periods of elongated consequence. It turns out that digressing into distantly related regions where diminution of the harmonic rhythm fits comfortably instead of waiting for a cadence makes the uh, modulation at the end of the phrase feel rather tame in contrast and uh, max masks its impact. So this brings me to the compositional puzzle of the transition. This sort of conundrum pops up constantly, and a lot of the literature that I've seen uh, neglects and a lot of the literature that I've seen neglects to cover it in the kind of detail that I'd sometimes like to see. So let's take a moment and think about it. I have this idea.
but they don't go together. Now, I could just smack them together, one directly after the other, without any further preparation. Here's what that sounds like. Now, that's okay in some ways, but I think I can do better. What I need here is a transition, a graceful way to get from one to the other. Here's what I'm looking for out of such a transition. I need to modulate, that is, get from the first key signature to the other, from one tonal region to the next. I need to preserve the integrity of the voice leading and make sure that each instrument is playing a continuous line that makes sense by itself. I also need to adjust the texture to make sure that the gap between the one variety of counterpoint and the other sounds logical and not disjointed. I want to find elegant solutions to each of those requirements, and I don't want to spend too many bars accomplishing it, because I don't want to put the focus on the transition, but rather on the two adjoining thematic statements in which it serves. By the time I'm ready to join these two ideas up, I have something that's beginning to look like a cadential figure at the end of the first theme, and a thin texture establishing the motive at the beginning of the second. So that gives me a bit of room to play with in between. I prolong the tonic at the end of the cadential figure as a pedal point that overlaps the second theme a bit to reinforce the harmonic continuity. I have a destabilizing ornamental motive that I like at uh, the end of the second theme that I'll borrow over here to signal the modulation. That's this bit. Given the idiomatic gestural vocabulary that I've already established, it helps to prepare the ear to slide out of the existing harmonic region without contrasting too much with the tonic in the pedal point underneath. So here's how it sounds now. Since the second theme doesn't actually ever confirm its own tonic, I'm going to exercise some artistic license and refuse to state it at the beginning of the theme here as well. That will give me a nice structural elision which effectually denies the listener any cut and dry reference to a clear harmonic relationship with the original key moving into the second theme. Look at the harmonic arc that I'm drawing as the expo exposition unfolds. And that's the big picture that I'm keeping in mind throughout the journey from one theme into the next, and uh, really between the two of them. Next up, the voice leading gets filled in with a static figure that reflects, as soon as possible, the textural characteristics of the second theme, and the top voice starts to move into position. Halfway through my first complete phrase, the texture shifts to reflect an act of harmony. So now I'm going to take that and decide that it's a B section. As it is, my form now reads A, B, A, C. No oh, wave, I'm sorry. A, B prime, A prime, C. I'm not ready to consider the B prime its own section yet because it's clearly not capable of standing on its own in its current incarnation. All it does is resolve from A to A prime. So before I feel comfortable calling it B by itself, it's going to have to walk on its own two legs. The, f the form that I ended up with uh, puts the fully crystallized B section quite, na quite near the end, and only makes reference to it on the way there. 
So, we get A, B prime, A prime, C, A. So we get A, B prime, C, A. So we get A, B prime, A prime, C, A. Um, so we get A, B, A, C, A, B, C, A, which is a typical Rondo form. My challenge for you, then, is to write a saxophone quartet. Sound off in the comments, and... I'll see you next time. Until then, bye. This is YouTube, so I, I think I should try to cook something now, right?